Good morning. Glad to see all of you here this morning. It's good to spend some time in worship with you today. As you can see, of course, the stage is set. Uh, we're ready for another exciting Vacation Bible School this week. And, and it is my hope that uh, we will have as, as much prayer and participation as, as you can give so that we can make this uh, a pleasing offering to God, our service, and also uh, a light for our community as well. I hope you'll plan to be a part of this. Uh, let's begin with a, with a word of prayer as we enter into God's Word this morning. Dear Lord, your grace is all that we have and all that we are. As we pause this morning to reflect on your word, the story of your people in scripture, help us to be thankful for the grace you have extended to us, the grace of your presence in our lives the grace of your desire to be with us, so much so that you gave us your Son. May we be a people who live out of the overflow of that grace to us. May it fill our speech. May it fill our hearts. May it be the motivation behind all of our actions. Help us to be like you. And it's in Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen. Have you ever been between homes? Like maybe you've sold your house and you're still waiting to find that next place where you're going to live. Or maybe you've found it and you're making preparations, getting it ready, and there's just a little bit of time in between. If so, have you, do you remember what that felt like? Do you remember what that little in-between time was like for you? Maybe it's getting married. Maybe it's when two are becoming one and, and one of you is going to go from the place where you've been and join up with the, the other. Or maybe you're both starting new together, moving out of that college apartment and into a new place or into that college apartment, but together this time. And you know where you want to be. You know where you're planning to be. You know where you're going. And you know where you've been, but you're not really in either of those places anymore. You're for a time, you're in between. This can happen when you're going off to college. Or maybe you take a new job and you're moving out of the nest, whatever the nest may be for you. At times in our lives, many of us will find ourselves in this sort of in-between moment, in between where we've been and where we're going. And I wonder, some of you have probably had this experience, maybe more than once in your life, what was that like? What was that like for you to be in between? Sometimes this can be a great thing. Sometimes being in between can be almost painfully exciting because you're just so ready to be in that next place, right? From time to time, uh, Alyssa and I watch a, a TV show called Fixer Upper on HGTV. Guys, that's just a few clicks south of ESPN. It's a brave new world. You should try it out sometime. We watch this show every now and then together, and of course, if you've watched it, the, the stars of the show are these folks, Chip and Joanna Gaines. Their job is to take the, as they say, the, the worst house in the best neighborhood and make it into your dream home. And so people come to them from all over the place. This all happens down in Waco, Texas, which, by the way, has gotten really cool these days. Uh, Waco, Texas, there they are. They're, they're doing these houses, and people come to them. They're in between the, the place where they've been and the place that they want to be. And so Chip and Joanna take them around town. They go to different houses and they go and they see these different homes that none of them they would want to live in as they are right now. But they pick one out anyway and then they wait. They're not allowed to watch as the process takes place. They just wait while demolition happens and renovation happens and decoration happens and every now and then they might get a call sometimes if they're a little bit under uh, they need to spend a little more money or something like that but more or less they're in the dark until they're standing on the street right across from their new house right there on the curb but they can't see it because there's a big huge canvas blocking their view, and on that big canvas, there's a blown-up picture of 
the house as it used to be when they first saw it, and they're waiting there in that dramatic in-between moment, waiting for the canvas to be pulled back and waiting to see their fixer-upper. And you can imagine it, right? It's this agonizingly exciting moment because the future is so bright and you know it's right there. It's just behind this canvas. You just can't wait to see it. Sometimes the in-between can be almost painfully exciting. At other times, it's just painful. Sometimes it's just agonizingly stressful to be in this in-between because maybe the future is not looking so bright. I'll give you an extreme example. Uh, in high school, I, I read a, a novel in English class. It was a, it's a work of fiction, but the characters are not real, but the experience in the story is very much real. It's a novel by this fellow, Alan Payton, wrote a book called Cry the Beloved Country. Alan Payton is a South African novelist, and he wrote this book in around 1950 about the apartheid experience that was going on, still going on at that time in South Africa. And it's a novel about what it's like to live in a place and time where so few people have so much and so many people have so little. About midway through the book, he just stops talking about his main characters and he tells a parable. These people in the story, this family, are looking for a house in Johannesburg, the capital of South Africa, and they're not alone because everybody is looking for a house in Johannesburg in South Africa. He writes that all roads lead to Johannesburg. If you're white or if you're black, they lead to Johannesburg. If the crops fail, there's work in Johannesburg. If there are taxes to be paid, there's work in Johannesburg. If the farm is too small to be divided up any further, someone is going to have to get up and go to Johannesburg, and everybody all at once is leaving their homes, whatever's left of them, and they're descending upon this sprawling city, and there's just not enough room. There's not a place for everybody there, and so you go there, and you get on a waiting list to buy a home, and you wait on that waiting list for five years waiting to buy a home, unless you can maybe scrape up enough money that you could bribe the person who holds the list. And if not, you go from house to house in Johannesburg with your baby in your arm and your hat in your hand, and you say, do you have one room that you could rent from me, the six of us in our family? Because all roads lead to Johannesburg, but when you get there, it may not be enough. The future may not look so bright from this place where you stand in between. Sometimes the in-between is painfully exciting. Sometimes it's just painful. And I don't know which it is in our story about the people of Judah from Scripture today in our story, the people of Judah are very much so in between. They're in between homes in a very real sense. But I'm really not sure whether this is for them a moment, one of those hopeful, just can't wait, exciting moments of being in between, or whether it's the other kind. You tell me. We're in Ezra chapter 3. Actually, first, uh, when the story of Ezra and Nehemiah begins, there are those two books in the Old Testament you know are actually one book written together at the time, when that story begins, the people of Judah have been in exile for about 70 years under Babylonian kings. But as we turn the page and we begin that very first page of Ezra, we see that something big has already happened. We read there that this story is going to take place in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, not Babylon, that's because Persia has gone and knocked Babylon off of the throne of all those conquered lands. And so now they're the sheriff in town. And this is the first year of King Cyrus. And so as he takes over these newly conquered lands, he says, I'm going to win their favor. 
I'm going to do something and gain their loyalty. And so he takes and he says to many of those conquered people, he says, guess what? I'm a gracious king. I'd like to take care of you guys, so why don't you just go home for a bit? Why don't you just go home and rebuild the temple of your gods, whatever those gods might be? Well, we learn in the first chapter of Ezra that the Jewish people are some of those to whom he says go. Go back to Jerusalem, your home. Rebuild your temple. He even uses the name of their God, our God, the Lord God. He says, thus says King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judea. Any of those among you who are his people are now permitted to go up to Jerusalem and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. Cyrus says, go if you want to. 42,000 thereabouts, people, Jewish people, take up the charge and they go. That's what chapter 2 says. They go west, across that sprawling desert in between them in exile and their former home, many of them going to a place that they've never been before. They were born into exile. And when they get back, they begin to settle in. They begin to find the old acres and lots and places where their families used to live. And they go find those places and they set up shop around there. Some time passes while they get settled in. And then in chapter 3, it's time to do something with these ruins that once were God's temple. And this is where I'm not sure what the pulse is of this group. Because on the one hand, right, this should be the exciting moment because this is what they've been waiting for, right? They've come all this way back to Jerusalem to do this and maybe they just have this energy about them, this hope that says we are about to do what God has blessed us to do. We're going to rebuild this temple. We're going to reestablish God's name in the place where it belongs. Maybe they just can't wait to get started. Maybe they're just so hopeful. Or maybe there are others we might not be so sure. In fact, we're about to see that there are. Maybe some that are a little bit discouraged even still. Because now they see it right there in front of them. And boy, is this a fixer-upper. Stone by stone from the ground up. And what if, after all that work, it's not even as good as it was before? In fact, if we look a little bit forward in this chapter, verses 10, 11, and 12, if you're following along, I think we get to see that when the construction finally begins, there are mixed emotions about what this is going to be like. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple, when they finally begin working, all the people responded with a great shout, we're told. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families Old people who had seen the first house on its foundations wept with a loud voice when they saw this new house, though many shouted aloud with joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of people's weeping. In other words, standing there, standing in this in-between, the full range of emotions that you could feel about a past that has gone by, about a future that lies ahead, they're all here at this moment. In this in-between, the sadness and the joy, they're here. In this moment we call the present, the present tense. Now, I don't know about you, but i, I got to tell you, sometimes I find it difficult to live in the present. And maybe you do too. When I say that, I'm not talking about some sort of kind of superficial, carefree, listless attitude that says you only live once, so just live it up, right? That's not what I'm talking about. Scripture talks about that. It says some people say, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. The Scripture says don't do that. That's not what I mean by living in the present. What I mean is that sometimes it takes some effort, right? Some intentionality and some in attention 
in order to recognize the gift of today, to recognize the God-given gift of this moment and cherish it and make use of it. It's hard for me to do that sometimes. It's easy to think about the past. It's easy to think about the future. And really, we should be thinking about each of those things because the past has riches for us to learn from. And the future is what we're planning and preparing to live into, right? But what about today as well? Isn't it possible that that consumption with the past or just so focused on what's to come can crowd out what God has called us to do and see here today? In the midst of all that memory and all this motion forward, we might find it hard to just stand in between it all and be here and listen for God right here. Here's what can easily happen. Most of us, writes Barbara Brown Taylor, most of us spend so much time thinking about where we have been or where we're supposed to be going that we have a hard time recognizing where we actually are. When someone asks us where we want to be in our lives, the last thing that would occur to us to do is just to look down at our feet and say, here, I guess since this is where I am. Yet for Christians, we believe that God really does care deeply about what we do with where we are, with where we are right here, with where we stand today. God cares deeply about what we make of this present moment that we find us in, no matter what past and what future we may be standing in between. And so Jesus says these words, don't worry about your life. Is life not more important than food? Life not more important than clothes? Consider the birds of the air. Think about the lilies of the field. Seek first my kingdom, my righteousness. All these things will be taken care of as well. Jesus is concerned about how we make use of our present circumstances, what we make of our todays as we have them. And so he says, today's trouble is enough for today. Matthew chapter 6. There's another story in Luke chapter 10 where Jesus is visiting two of his favorite people, Mary and Martha, their sisters. And Martha is so worried about the things that haven't gotten done yet. And she's so worried about making sure that they're ready for what happens next that she's scurrying all about the house. And what does Jesus say? He turns to Mary and he says, Mary, you've chosen the better thing. Mary who's paused and who's sitting at Jesus' feet, making most of that present moment. Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but there is only need of one thing. When this band of Jewish travelers is standing there at the ruins of the temple, some of them are holding back tears because of what once was, Others of them are just dreaming up what can be and they're pacing the floor in excitement. But what I love about this passage the most is what really happens before a single stone is lifted. This is what these people do before they begin to construct this temple. The people of Judah stop. They pause what they're doing and they remember that God is God right where they are. God is God right there in the present tense. And not only that, but God wants to be with them right where they are. And here's how they do it. Verse 3. They set up an altar on its foundations, and they kept the festival of booths as prescribed and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the ordinance as required for each day. Such a tiny little verse, we might gloss over it if we're not careful. But don't miss the significance of this. Because before a single stone is lifted, before the construction begins, these builders of the temple stop and they hold a festival 
And this is not like a three-hour party. This is a seven-day festival called the Festival of Booths. Other times it's called the Feast of Tabernacles or Tents. We'll get back to that. And this feast is called the Festival of Booths because for seven days you would build up for your family a little booth, a little hut or tent. You'd make one up yourselves and you would live inside that booth or hut or tent for seven days instead of living in your actual home. Why? So that your generations may know and remember God says that I made the people of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, meaning when they were in the wilderness. For I am the Lord your God. In other words, God wants his people to remember that when God took them and rescued them from their past, their, their time in slavery in Egypt, and when God brought them forward to that future they had in the promised land, there was an in-between time. A time in between in the wilderness where everything didn't make sense. And there was a lot of excitement, yes. There was a lot of sadness, too. There was a lot of confusion about what's going to happen next. No matter, because God was with them there. Even in the in-between, God was with them. So they were walking around and setting up shop, setting up temporary houses, wandering through the wilderness. But they weren't alone, because God was there. In fact, in the story, God even pitches his own tent with them, right? Symbolically. It's what we call the, the tabernacle. God pitches a tent right there in the midst of all those other tents, which is to say, God dwelled with his people Right there in the in-between, God made his presence felt in the present tense. And when you know that God is the God of right where you are, that changes things. And this is what I want us to think about. God is the God of right where you are. And he wants to be with you right where you are you are, so that we can cherish this moment, this gift that we've been given in such a way that redeems the past and readies us for our future. That's why we're starting a new series this month. And it's a series about Jesus. We're going to talk about Jesus and about the God who is God right where we are in this messy in-between, between our pasts and our futures. Because we want to know what it means that God the Son, John calls him the Word. We want to know what it means that the Word became flesh and lived among us. When he says lived, literally, he pitched his tent among us. He tabernacled among us. He dwelled with us right there in the middle of everything. God wanted to be there because our God is the God of right now in your life. So much so that he took on human skin just so he could be with people like us and point us toward a future with him. So our question for this morning our question for this series is, what does it mean for God to be the God of right where you are? What does it mean that God desires to dwell with you? When we look down at our feet, and when you see where you stand today, what would it mean for God to dwell with you and want to dwell, to dwell with you right where you stand? How does that change things for you? Because it's easy to get discouraged about the past, or it's easy to get obsessed with it too, the glory days, the, the glory years. It's also easy to get so focused on the future, whether it's our excitement about what's to come or it's our worry about what's to come. It's easy to get so locked into these things that we, we miss 
the gift of this moment. But God wants to be with us in this moment as much as every other moment. So what does that mean for us? If God is the God of today for you, how does that change things? That's our challenge for today. Maybe we answer this challenge by taking a breath, saying a prayer, and remembering that there are opportunities to love and serve God even today that we ought to notice. Maybe we see them spread out about us on this auditorium and on this stage. Maybe the opportunity to remember that God is the God of today is to put yourself into His work today as we try to tell the story to children and parents alike of how God was with His people as they went out of Egypt this week. Maybe it means something else for you. Maybe what it means is making a change in your life. Maybe a big one. Maybe the fact that God wants to be with you right where you are and go with you to the places He'll lead you means you're ready to follow. You're ready to walk with Him, to be more like Christ. Maybe you're ready to be baptized into His name, commit your life to following Him like never before. Or maybe it just means turning your heart to Him yet again. Restoring our hearts to his heart as we think about the lengths to which he would go to be with us today. Whatever the case may be and however God's word may be challenging your heart this morning, we're going to take a moment here as we close to praise God because he is the God of today. And we're going to take a moment to reflect in our hearts and maybe publicly if you choose to respond on how God is challenging us to be like Him and cherish the gift that He has given us this morning. Whatever the case may be, we offer this moment while together we stand and while we sing.